Welcome to lecture number eight for Civ 360. And in this lecture, what we want to do is kind of vector in on being ready for our first exam. And the way that I handle details of this exam is I'm going to send you some written documentation on this to make sure that you understand what you're responsible for and the format and the nature of the exam. So I'll do that outside of lecture. So I'm going to send you a couple of things. First off, I will send you what I will refer to as an exam summary. And that has some of the details about what's going to be contained. So the main thing that you're interested in is, uh, one is first off, uh, how uh, you're going to take the exam. Uh, the second is uh, the when. And the third, of course, which is the most important, is the content. I'll, I'll call this the content and the format. And so I'll detail, uh, first off, the sort of questions that you can anticipate, but also the subjects that you'll be dealing with. Briefly, though, for our first exam, what we're going to uh, have embedded inside is everything that we've done up to this point and all the way up to uh, statically indeterminate axial bars. And there's kind of some good news about the statically indeterminate axial bars in that I am guaranteeing you one of those types of problems. So we will uh, promise that there are going to be embedded inside either a multi-part or um, something that focuses on statically indeterminate axially loaded bars. And because that's such a critical topic, um, I'm going to be uh, broadening that in just a little bit. But in any event, I do want you to be prepared uh, for that. Uh, so the exam material uh, is all going to be up to and including what we're talking about today, but we're going to do a little bit of review on that. Let's talk about then what, um, so let me block that out. Before we go through, again, the statically indeterminate axial bar types of problems, let's uh, maybe ask what equations you need to be responsible for. I am a be big believer, um, so me, I'm a big believer in committing certain things to memory. Now, that means that for our exams that are going to be run during the course of the semester, I'm going to expect you to know certain things. And I don't want you to have to use a crutch of an equation sheet or a book or anything like that. Now, for the final, it will be a little bit different. But for the exams that we're going to be taking during the course of the semester, uh, I, don't, I don't run that way because your brains, for the most part, even you non-traditionally aged students, are malleable right now. You have the capacity to remember an awful lot, and this is going to make you into a more powerful and a more focused engineer. So what equations do we need to know? Let's bullet that. What equations? do you need to have kind of committed to memory? So let's uh, maybe enumerate those. The first one would be a sigma is equal to P over A type of expression. Now that could also be a tau is equal to V over A. Examples of this would have been the very first problem that we did. You know, we had a axial bar like this where we loaded it. So if I gave you that and I gave you the dimensions A and B and I gave you P, then you should certainly know that sigma is equal to p divided by a times b. Uh, example of shear would have been our lap joint problem. So remember that one where we have the uh, section like this and like this, and we overlaid two lap joints, and there was a bond connection there. So there you should certainly know that the shear stress is equal to the resultant force, shear force in this case, divided by the resultant area. Okay, so sigma is equal to P over A. You do not have to know or commit it to memory the expressions for sigma and tau on an inclined plane. However, I do want you to know for, the, for a problem of this type, we've got a couple things that I do ask you to commit to memory. Namely, the maximum normal stress that you can possibly get is going to be P over A when theta is equal to zero degrees. That's the maximum possible normal stress that you can get in an axially loaded bar 
cut at an inclined plane. The tau max is half of that. It's going to be P over 2A, and that occurs when theta is equal to 45 degrees. So I do expect you to have that committed to memory. And on this plane, where we have a tau max, sigma is equal to P over 2A. Let's call that sigma at 45 degrees, just as an ad hoc designation. So it turns out that the numerical values are the shear stress and the normal stress on an inclined plane when theta is equal to 45 degrees are the same thing. So those are really um, some important features uh, that you need to really have committed to memory. You don't have to have the rest of them. If you do, that's great. But I don't want you to uh, use up brain space to having memorized those particular expressions. So those are the expressions that we had then for the stress. Then we went to strain. So you need to also then know that normal strain is basically the change in length over the original length. And clearly you have to know that if it grows, it grows in length, it's positive. If it shrinks in length, it's going to be negative. So that is the uh, definition, basically, or the memorized equation, if you will, for the normal strain. The shear strain, gamma, is equal to the change in angle. I'll call it the delta theta between two originally perpendicular lines. And this has to be in radians. Remember that. And we also have that mnemonic device that, I guess it's more of a physical character. If they're like this and they get smaller, that's positive. If they're here and they get bigger, it hurts our thumb and our forefinger, and that would be a negative sign convention. So that's not really an equation that I want you to have committed to memory, but it's a principle that you need to have committed to memory and not even have to think about it. You need to know, really know those things cold. Then we also have committed to memory the expressions for the one-dimensional constitutive law. By one-dimensional, I mean if we have a normal stress and there's one normal strain, it is sigma is equal to E times epsilon. Then in the case of pure shear, we have tau is equal to G times gamma. And then finally, the Poisson ratio is defined as the negative of the transverse strain divided by the axial strain when there is only an axial stress. So something like that. So in other words, we're pulling on it in the axial direction. That's the sigma A. And then the trans, so that's the sigma A again. And then we have the transverse direction. That's going to be this one. So axial is this way, transverse is this way. So that is the definition of the Poisson ratio. It's just a ratio of strains that uh, is generated then when we apply the stress in one direction and get strains in the other two. So those are pretty fundamental. And again, you could say they're memorized equations, they're memorized principles, however you want to cast that. Make sure, incidentally, that you know the names, what they mean, the symbols and the dimensions of all of our expressions. So this is kind of a parenthetical. We have normal stress, shear stress, normal strain, shear strain, Elastic modulus slash modulus elasticity, shear modulus, Poisson ratio. So know their names. Know their symbols. And know their dimensions. And we've mentioned that before. So make sure that you've got that, those down cold as well. All right, what next? Well, we also then extended that into uh, the stress-strain law af after that fact, we integrated the strain. And we found then that delta is equal to the integral from 0 to L of P over AE dx. So that means this is strain for an axially loaded bar only, and we integrate the strain to get the displacement. However, the good news is we tabled this for exam one. So this is not for exam number one, there's enough that you have to have committed to memory for exam one. Instead, we specialize that for the case when P, A, and E are all constant. So if P, 
A and E don't vary, then you've got delta is a fair, very famous formula, PL over AE. That one you do have to have committed to memory. So that's another memorized equation that you need to have right off at the top of your head. And again, you really don't even want to have to think about it. It just wants to roll off of your tongue. You should know what all of those terms mean. And uh, if you need to practice that or ask questions on it, then that would be fine. Then finally, our sixth, oh, maybe we should put in a little bit of a, a subtext on the, um, uh, on the elastic constants or the constitutive law. This is not really a memorized equation per se, but make sure you also know the uh, fact that we are dealing with a linear elastic homogeneous isotropic solid. That would not be a memorized equation. So it's kind of outside the realm of what we're talking about right this second. But um, I should have mentioned that when we're talking about the stress-strain law. So clearly we're looking at only this type of solid. Then finally, I'll say the seventh set of expressions that you need to know or the things that you need to have committed to memory are for the statically, statically indeterminate axial bars. And for that, we need the big three, which is going to be, the first is going to be statics. That means the deformed solid has to be in equilibrium. Secondly, the stress-strain law, the axial bars inside of our system have to follow known material laws, but the way that that manifests itself is going to be delta is PL over AE. Why? Because if I bring over an L, we have delta over L, which is the strain, which is P over A times 1 over E. But P over A is stress, so it would just be sigma divided by E. Then finally, the third leg of our three-legged stool that makes us a powerhouse on these is going to be compatibility. So those are the concepts, equations that you need for exam one, and conveniently that closes out part A.